Welcome everyone. This is the um, session on high achievement in senior secondary music programs and your presenter is Rachel, Rachel White. Um, she's a creative arts educator and PhD candidate based in Sydney, New South Wales. She's worked in primary and secondary schools as a music and drama teacher and her research interests include contemporary music pedagogy, education of the musically gifted and educational psychology. Rather than listening to me though, I'm going to hand over to Rachel and she's going to share her experiences and knowledge all about that. So over to you, Rachel. Hi everyone, thanks so much for, for joining me today. Um, a bit of just an update, um, when I wrote my profile, I wrote that a couple of months ago and actually since then I've started um, working uh, at the University of Sydney in the Faculty of um, Social Sciences, um, the School of Education and Social Work. Um, so I'm, I've moved, moved along in, in terms of different things. Um, but this uh, PhD study that I conducted over the last couple of years was through the Sydney Conservatorium of Music um, with my uh, primary supervisor, Jennifer Rowley, um, and secondary supervisor, James Humberstone, who were just absolutely fabulous people. So that's basically what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, just going pretty much through an overview of my study um, and the findings from it and kind of where I think it, it should go from here. Um, so a couple of things just worth mentioning. This was a study that was conducted in New South Wales. Um, so uh, a lot of the terms that I use are New South Wales centric. Um, so just in case you're not familiar, um, just really briefly, um, this study was conducted in uh, to do with senior secondary music, so year 11 and year 12, um, uh, uh, which are the HSC music courses. And in New South Wales, they consist of music one, music two and music extension. Um, and the two main ones, which are music one and two, um, those courses consist of teaching and learning in performing, listening, composition and musicology. Um, the, fo the other focus was also on uh, what's called band six and E4 results. So these are basically um, the sort of more, I guess, informal terminology referring to a result of 90 plus out of 100 in uh, either music one or music two, or 45 plus out of 50 for music extension. Um, but just for ease of um, use, rather than saying band four, band six, and E4, I'll just say band six kind of for the rest of this thing. Um, and the reason why I focused on, on band six in particular, a um, couple of reasons, it's socially, it's a very important thing uh, in year 12 and HSC um, sort of uh, areas in New South Wales to get a band six is a big deal. Um, but also the way that a band six is described um, by, by Nessa um, is basically, it, me it means the student has uh, reached a very high level of musical expertise and understanding um, in either of the courses. So um, prior to starting my study, I basically did a bit of reconnaissance. So I looked at the distinguished achievers lists from 2007 to 2016. These are publicly available lists um, that basically show all of the students um, in every course um, across the state who have received a band six in any subject. Um, and I obviously focused on the music subjects and looking at these results, it seemed that there were several schools that had a lot of band sixes each year, which could be a marker of, of a high achieving music program. But I didn't want to just focus on schools that had you know, really big cohorts of students because just because you've got a big cohort and means you're more likely to get a lot of band sixes, but that doesn't mean that schools with smaller cohorts aren't necessarily also doing really well with their students. So I thought rather than just see who's got the most, I thought it would be better to look at who's got the highest percentage of students with each cohort. Um, and look across over like a 10 year period and sort of establish who's got a really consistent record of achievement. Um, so I applied to NESA to get access to HSC music results um, and also enrollment numbers. So not just, uh, you know, how many students each year got a band six in the music courses, but how many students were enrolled so that I could figure out the percentage of students for each school, each cohort at each school. Um, that uh, received um, a band six. So um, after a couple of months, I got a, a, a data file um, and they actually gave me more than what I asked for, which was very nice. 
Um, so it contained all the student enrolment data for year 12 um, and uh, information about like the number of students per school um, across New South Wales. Um, and also a couple of other schools um, in Canberra and internationally um, that also run HSC Music. And it showed the band, the achievement band received by each student. So whether they got anything from band one to band six, that was shown in the data. They also gave me this, the enrolment data for year 10 and year 11, um, as well as the marks for most of those years as well. Um, so that's just a, an example of what um, the data looked like. So it was all de-identified, um, you know, no student names, no student genders, um, and also the schools were de-identified as well. So basically, as I said before, my plan from here was to use band six achievement data to identify consistently high achieving music programs. Um, I decided to look over a period of 10 years because even as I was looking at the data, um, I could see that there were some years where a school um, had a, did really, really well. Like there were actually a few years where schools, 100% of their students, you know, like six out of six, 10 out of 10 students got a band six, but that wasn't the case for every single year. So I thought it would be better to look over 10 years and see, you know, who is consistently performing well, rather than choose, say, one year where there might be a couple of schools that just did really well for lots of different reasons, um, but maybe don't have that consistency um, over different cohorts. Um, so this is just a, an example of a couple of different kinds of schools and how I uh, put their information into spreadsheets. So um, that first school in orange, they only had, uh, for this particular year, only had students in Music 2 and Music Extension. The two in the middle, the green and the yellow, had students in Music 1, 2 and Extension, and then the blue school only had students in Music 1. So I pretty much did this for every school, every year, in every course. Um, in terms of, of some of the literature that really heavily influenced the study design, um, the two at the top there, Ayers, Dinham and Sawyer, and Ayers, Sawyer and Dinham were very, very influential. Um, they basically inspired me to go, well, they've kind of done what I want to do. They've done it before, but they did it, you know, 20 years ago. So it would be good to do something similar to that. Um, but, and with a focus on music. Um, the, those uh, articles and reports there were more generally about HSC success. Um, and they found a lot of really interesting results looking at uh, like, again, high achieving cohorts and teachers who were really exceptional at, at HSC teaching. Um, the, the Henriksen um, article was actually it's, uh, a Danish um, article and it's about a, a really a highly successful sailing team um, and they did basically just wanted to look at them because they had a record of excellent results and wanted to focus on you know a team that was doing really well and see what they were doing and that's again influenced the way I was thinking I want to look at who's doing this really really well and what are they doing um, and that also connects with the McPherson and Williamon article um, re a really, really good um, work just talking about musical giftedness um, and all of the different aspects to consider for that. Um, but also, again, talking about um, looking at the performance of established experts. So essentially designing a study that was a top-down study, looking at who's doing it really well and what can we and everyone else learn from what they're doing really well in order to improve everyone's practice. Um, really briefly on the method, um, so I'm using the data, I identified the top 10% of schools uh, with an HSC music cohort during those 10 years, um, which resulted in a list of 71 schools across New South Wales and one school outside of New South Wales. Um, from there, I spoke to Nessa and part, like part of the agreement was that they would formally re-identify those schools for me. So I was able to find out um, who those schools were um, and then create a, a stratified sample so that I wasn't just, I wasn't just sort of going from, okay, who were the top 10% of the top 10%? I was looking at all the different kinds of schools there were, boys, girls, co-ed, um, you know, in Sydney, um, in regional New South Wales, um, K to 12, 7 to 12, all of those different kinds of schools and trying to get a range of schools that I could contact and then go to interview the teachers at the schools. 
Um, so I was able to go to lots of schools all around New South Wales, which was awesome, and talk to the teachers there and see their music programs. Um, and it resulted in a total of 50 teachers in 23 schools across New South Wales. Um, I won't actually go into this entire process because it's not as interesting as you might think. Um, it just looks pretty with the pictures. Um, but basically the coding process um, was, it was a very organic process with taking what was uh, coming out of the data. Some of the coding was influenced by um, like the interview questions. So there was, for example, a specific question about gifted education. Um, and so any, anything that mentioned gifted ed related aspects, I, that was coded as a really big overall code and then sort of uh, like child nodes were taken from that. And then there were other things that came out of the data, um, which I'll talk about um, for a few things. For example, um, authentic learning in particular, that wasn't in any of the, the literature or, or even my thoughts in, uh, in going into the interview process, but was something that came out of the interview data with the teachers. So these were the main themes that came from the interviews. Um, uh, like this is basically how you can summarise everything um, in terms of the different factors that contribute to high achievement. Um, so these were school culture and in particular leadership, um, the presence of a co-curricular program and supportive parents. Um, and you'll see parents actually comes up again. Um, socioeconomic status was a really uh, big influence, um, including uh, ICSIA and access to resources. Then there were student factors. Um, it wasn't as strongly uh, examined because my focus was on the teachers. There's not as much information about the student level factors, but still some of these came through, including again, parents and whether they were supportive or not. Um, musical ability, psychosocial skills, and the ATAR as well uh, was a big influence. And then in effective teaching, uh, like gifted education came in in terms of enrichment and extension, but also um, authentic learning practices and teacher efficacy. So I'm just gonna talk through um, some of the quotes uh, and results and things um, overall. So uh, in terms of school culture, one of the key things was definitely leadership. Um, and there's a great article by uh, it's, uh, Van der Westhuizen. I don't think that's how you pronounce their name, but uh, that's what I'm gonna go with. Um, and they, in their article, a study of different schools, they talked about how music was part of the storytelling of their school. And I think that, I just really love that phrase. And I really think that came through in a lot of the teachers that I talked to um, that, you know, uh, so MS talked about how their principal knew the value of the arts and because they valued the arts that then transcended into the school culture overall and the kind of support that they gave. Um, I interviewed a former principal who had actually been a principal at two of the schools in the top 10%. Um, and she said, you know, music needs to be seen as a worthwhile activity. It's not just something that, you know, certain kids do because they're special, but it's part of the school and what the school is and what, it's, what it does. Um, and Gigi sort of was really also emphatic. He'd gone through a, a couple of different um, like executives, uh, executive groups and, you know, and could sort of see the difference between support and non-support. And he said, you know, it's really important that executives, that principals are seen to be supporting the arts. They're going to the concerts. They're talking about how great this student did in their recital on the weekend, um, you know, at assemblies and that sort of thing. Um, so the leadership definitely, that really came through as a key element of, of not necessarily directly contributing to high achievement, but to how the teachers felt in their role in the school and, and how um, music was perceived and its importance um, and making the teachers feel valued in their position. Um, also part of school culture that came through really strongly was the importance of co-curricular programs. Every school in my study, um, and I'm pretty sure every school in the top 10% had a co-curricular performance program. So they, a lot of the schools had multiple ensembles present. They had concert bands, orchestras, chamber groups, jazz bands, and other sort of miscellaneous things. There was one uh, school that had a whole lot of piano players um, that they didn't know what to do with. So they they just created like a piano playing group. And one of the teachers, 
um, arranged uh, certain certain like band scores for piano and just sort of rewrote them and got the students on electric pianos and you know find the brass sound and find the clarinet sound and that's what they did as an ensemble um so like all of the teachers talked about how important the the co-curricular pro programs were um you know uh, CO talked about how it's important in terms of mentoring and just getting students interacting with a range of different students um, NP in particular thought it was really important for HSC level students to be in the co-curricular program so that they're not just focusing just on their pieces for their HSC. You know, they're playing in bands, they're listening to other people, they're learning um, explicitly and implicitly from the music that's around them. Um, so co-curricular pro programs are really important for building relationships. They're important for building performance skills beyond, you know, their individual solo practice as well as other um, interpersonal and non-cognitive skills. It also helps, and this is in the literature, it helps to uh, promote connections with the school and a feeling of engagement and like positivity with, with the school, both for the students in the program and what the, the ensemble performing does for the culture of the school as well. Um, and lastly in this is supportive parents and I'll, I'll skip over this a little bit because I'll talk a bit more about the other side of supportive parents. So this is sort of um, particularly in connection with the uh, co-curricular programs as well. Um, you know, a lot of the teachers said a lot of what we do, we can't function without the support of the parents and, you know, the fact that they're here seven o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the evening, you know, uh, dropping off, picking up students from rehearsals, um, they're here, they're helping with the logistics of performing, um, you know, they're, they're moving instruments when we go and perform at a different school, all of those sorts of things. Um, yeah, a lot of the teachers talked about how great it was that they had such a good relationship with their parents and it helps the parents feel more involved in their, in their child's education as well. Uh, now, ICSEAL was a really big thing. Um, so you can see from this graph, this graph contains 513 um, re-identified schools um, from uh, the data that I received. And basically what it shows is that ICSIA contributes to up to half of the reason why a student can be uh, uh, not successful, can be high achieving in senior secondary music. Now it's not to say that it's the only factor and even even that it contributes to 50%, it's like I didn't do the kind of work necessary to be able to say exactly. It's because of, um, you know, the, the education level of the parents or any of that. It just basically says that if you are in a high X year school, you're more likely to, um, uh, to be able to achieve a band six than you are in a low X year school. But even then with that graph there, you can see that there are schools uh, who have lower ICSIA levels that are still achieving reasonably well um, in that, like over that 10 year period. But I thought that the ICSIA thing was really interesting. Um, again, parents, although they can be a really positive influence, they can also be kind of detrimental. And it was one of the interesting things about the study is that even at these schools, these schools that are really consistently high achieving big music cohorts, there were actually a number of students every year that would have been guaranteed band sixes, but their parents took them out of music for different reasons. Um, and there's a couple of the quotes there. Um, in some cases, it's, you know, because they think the parents think that the students won't get the marks they need, or they think, no, you're doing, you, you play your piano at home, that's enough. You have to do other subjects at school um, because, you know, music isn't what you're going to do afterwards anyway, so you may as well do other things. Um, and that was really interesting to me. And I thought about how, what's the way that we can change the narrative there? And I think part of it is to do with the ATAR. Um, so in terms of the ATAR and scaling, this was a really big thing. It was a question that I specifically asked was, how is it perceived with regards to the ATAR? And the overwhelming message was that it is negative. Um, it's a negative drag. It's just going to lower your ATAR. It's not rated very highly. You're going to get caned with scaling if you do music. And 
that just basically led me to think really carefully about it and have a look at the scaling reports that are released every year, try to learn about scaling. It's really hard. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend that if you're not a mathematical kind of person uh, uh, like me, you may try to look at the, the mathematics of it and you might just go, oh, too, too difficult. But if you look at just the scaling, yes, you can see here, this is in 2014, this graph here. And uh, comparing just to a, a different range of subjects, music one in particular is consistently right at the bottom um, in terms of how it's scaled. And music two isn't that great, it's kind of in the middle, but you can see that music one in particular is, it just, it drops off the lower, like even if you get a 90, um, like 90 out of 100, it already is, is way down below. And that's also the case if you look at the same scaling in 20, 2019, it's uh, like basically, if you look at just that aspect of it, music doesn't do very well. But that's why I thought it would be important to look at it in different ways. And if you look at how music um, performs for students who are like, you know, music is their best subject, what it actually does is it pulls up your ATAR. So this is just a graph um, where I looked at um, ATARs where four common subjects across all of these things, English, maths, biology and ancient history, they were all set to 85 out of 100. And then those 10 subjects were set to 95. And you can see that for, you know, generally well-performing students, but who have music as their strong subject, um, music two and music one actually pull ATARs up quite significantly. So this is just a little bit of it. There's more details about this in my thesis because I can go into more detail. Um, but I think that we need to change the narrative about music and the ATAR and scaling um, so that it's not just, oh, music does really badly because it, it does in one way and it doesn't in others. There are, there's nuance to it. Um, and I think that's important for us as music educators to learn about and to maybe even inform, you know, executive principals about to say, we need to change the narrative here. It's not just about just scaling by itself. Um, might just sort of work through some things reasonably quickly because I want to get to the advocacy part. Um, in terms of effective teaching, um, I managed to draw a lot about authentic learning um, from these teachers. In senior secondary music, authentic learning really comes through really strongly. Um, and what teachers really want and try to do is to make um, their senior secondary teaching and learning as not as like as close to real world practice as possible. Um, and that was something I think the senior secondary years are really an ideal year group to be doing this with. Um, so that's worth considering for senior secondary music. Um, these teachers also looked at lots of different ways that they could extend their students and enrich their teaching um, in the classroom. Um, uh, so, you know, that could mean extending them in previous years. Uh, it could mean extending them in the co-curricular co uh, groups. One, one teacher talked about a student who had a really extensive knowledge of the Rite of Spring. And she thought, well, there's nothing more I can teach him about this work, but what I can do is start to um, basically teach him how to communicate his ideas more effectively. And that's where they went um, with that student in particular really effectively. Um, they also did a lot of enrichment with their students. So thinking about what are some different directions that I can take these students? Um, so one talked about her roast sessions with Year 12. She had really good relationships with her Year 12 group and they all sort of understood, you know, these kind of performance workshops are a chance for us to play and also to talk really freely about what we think, what we like, what we don't like, where the improvement is. Um, and then other, other teachers talked about how they, uh, again, extended what they did with their co-curricular work. Um, and getting um, local composers in to uh, create compositions and then workshop them with their students. So I think the, the biggest message that I want to uh, get out about my the research that I've done here in 30 seconds or less um, is that this thesis, it's, it doesn't say if you do all these things, you will have band sixes. That's not what it's about. I think it's more about research like this means that music educators can take this research to their principals, to their school executives and say, 
you want us to do really well with our students, well, this is what you need. And a co-curricular music program is what schools need. And, and that means resources, it means funding, it means finances, and it means time. But with research like this, it means you can say, no, look, we've got research that says this is what we need. And it gives more of an impetus to executives and principals to say, okay, now we can see that this is, you know, this is a surefire way of, of improving results, of improving school culture. Um, I also think, as I said before, it's really important to think really carefully about how to talk about the ATAR. Quite a few teachers in the study were a bit like, yeah, I don't know, so I don't know how to talk about it, so I don't even really think about it. I think that we, it's, we need to do it not just for our students, but for our profession. We need to know what is the reality of scaling in the ATAR and how can we work around it? How can we talk about it with our students so that they're, they're better informed? They're not just getting their information from wherever they're getting it from because they are getting it from places like ATAR calculators, which is where I got my information from. Uh, we need to control that narrative. And of course, I think it's really important that there's supportive leadership in schools overall as well. And I think that's where I'm going to finish and see if there's any questions. Um, if we don't have time, that's fine. You can email me. Uh, and my full thesis is also on open access in uh, the University of Sydney. Hooray. Rachel, there's been no questions coming in so far, but there have been some comments coming in, which are, um, I think are worth feeding back to you and you might want to respond to part of it. Uh, James said that this scaling section of Rachel's PhD is mind blowing. Anyone teaching in New South Wales has also considered, has always considered it a dark art. <laughs> um, do read what Rachel has to say. Great ideas advocating music as HSC selection in your school. And um, agreed and suggested, and this is what I wonder if you might want to respond to, good to publish this even before the thesis, if that's possible. Uh, Megan also makes a comment from Queensland that music extension scaled lower than music. So I guess, yeah, music being the, the regular one, music extension, progressive extension. Uh, which is a combination of one and two. There we go. Um, Kirsten also saying that the findings are very helpful in changing the narrative coupled with the advocacy ideas. So you may want to um, respond to Anne's bit about whether the publish publishing can happen prior to the thesis. Uh, it can't uh, because my thesis has been submitted and marked and done. Um, but you, so you can access my my thesis there. I would I would love to publish the the ATAR section more widely. I'm not entirely sure where I can submit it because um, I think it I I would love for it to be out there in, in sort of more broadly accessible stuff. Um, but at the moment, yeah, it's just all there uh, in that link there um, for in in my thesis. Um, I'm really happy to send anyone the slides from this. So my email is there. Um, happy to send slides, happy even to send my thesis um, to anyone um, who, who would like it that way. Happy to chat more um, with anyone about any of these things. Um, so, yes, thank you to all the really lovely comments. Uh, we've um, got about a minute and a half. Anne, I notice you've come off um, mute. Do you want to actually address that at all? Anne Power? Uh, no, no, I'm fine. Thanks, right. Rachel. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, just for anyone who misses the email address for Rachel on there, it's also back on the um, ASME conference website where you would have seen the link to this um, Zoom. So if you miss it here, you can go back through to there and get the email there and contact Rachel directly. Okay, thank you everyone. It is time to go. So we might leave you to it and I hope you enjoy the remainder of the conference and thanks so much Rachel for putting in the hard yards, obviously. No worries. Thanks so much for coming, everyone. Okay, bye. Bye.